good morning. I am very pleased to be here. Uh, I want to talk mostly about, indeed, creationism, still crazy all the, after all these years, talk about some of the things that are going on today. But just as a quick schematic of what I'm going to talk about in terms of the history of this movement, creation science begat intelligent design, begat after a very important legal decision, Edwards versus Aguilard, two strains of anti-evolutionism. One strain was to promote the idea of teaching the evidence against evolution. The second strain was to promote the idea of teaching evolution and alternative theories to evolution. Now, I'm a scientist, there are a lot of scientists here. Just for the fun of it, how many scientists are here? Okay. Uh, afterwards, could you please bring up the list of evidence against evolution for me? <laughs> That's the reaction you get when you talk to scientists. What evidence against evolution? The big idea of biological evolution that living things shared common ancestors, we're not arguing about that. We argue about the details, we don't argue about common ancestry, about descent with modification. When you ask scientists, what about the alternative theories, you get the same sort of laughter or, or confused look. We don't know any alternative scientific theories to common ancestry. To the, I, uh, there's lots of, of debate about the process of evolution, the pattern that evolution has taken, but there aren't any alternative theories and there isn't a list of evidence against. If you go to the people who promote these ideas and you say, what are the alternative theories to evolution? Surprisingly enough, they seem to go back to what has traditionally been called intelligent design and creation science. Similarly, when you ask about the evidence against evolution, well, remarkably enough, we seem to be led back to those same arguments all over again. Now, I'm only going to very, very quickly go over creation science and intelligent design because most of you know a little bit about that anyway. If you don't, there's going to be a very good book sold after this uh, talk where you can learn a great deal more about these topics. Creation science is very largely the product of um, uh, Henry Morris and his followers who uh, built this movement from the 1960s on, which is still going very strong. I spoke about creation science when I was last invited to the AEI meetings in 07, and so you can you don't have to buy my book. You can also uh, hear about this uh, on the um, very excellent uh, videotapes that the uh, RDF prepares from these meetings. But the, the thing I want you to keep in mind for our purposes today, creation science, as well as intelligent design, are based upon a specific um, Christian doctrine called special creationism, which is an idea not just about God creating, but how God creates. The most important component of special creationism is that God creates everything in its present form. And that's true of galaxies, that's true of the planetary system, that's true of plants and animals on Earth today, human beings. A barnacle is a barnacle, a, an ape is an ape, a pine tree is a pine tree, and um, they were all created as separately created kinds with limited genetic variability. Um, so you can have evolution within the kind, but you can't have evolution from one kind to another. And the most uh, common form of special creationism is that this creation event took place at one time, over six 24-hour days. Now, I, I say it's usually uh, because there are other forms of special creationism, uh, something called progressive creationism, for example, which basically is what most of the intelligent design people are embracing which takes the idea that God does specially create things, but he creates them sequentially through time. So from the intelligent design perspective, God specially created the motor of the bacteria flagellum. That was a special creation. Now maybe other parts of the bacteria might be able to evolve, you know, evolve but that's just evolution within the bacterial kind, right? Um, bacteria don't evolve into giraffes, right? That's the general idea. The most important thing about special creationism is the creation of things in their present form. And that is a theme that we'll see running through uh, all the kinds of creationism. Now, the creation science movement continues to, oops, hello, go back again. 
continues to be a very large and very successful movement. Uh, by no means has uh, this creation science movement um, declined at all over the last uh, 15 or 20 years since the ascendancy of intelligent design. Um, there are probably, with the advent of the internet, more sources of creation science now than there were 15 or 20 years ago. These are the folks who brought you flood geology. Uh, the idea that all sedimentary deposits all over the planet were the result of Noah's flood. And for example, Grand Canyon was cut catastrophically when a huge amount of water burst through, you can see the lake there in the uh, Colorado Plateau, a huge amount of water burst through and cut Grand Canyon catastrophically, much as Glacial Lake Missoula created the uh, Channel Scablands up in Montana. There, you know, there are examples of catastrophic geology, certainly. This is not one of them. <laughs> if you want to know more about the Grand Canyon, of course, uh, you can go with NCSE to, uh, on a raft trip down Grand Canyon. We do that every summer. I will tell you the creationist side of the um, uh, story, and my colleague Alan Gishlick who is a PhD geologist, will tell you the evolution side, and of course you can make up your own mind. So, <laughs> see the canyon with Scott and Gish, sort of. If you read the creation science literature, you will find that they promote what they call the two-model approach. There's only two possibilities, either evolution or special creation. So therefore, if you disprove evolution, creationism wins by default. Remember this diagram, you're going to see it again, because this is a basic uh, thread that runs through the creationist movement, past and present and doubtless future. Now I mentioned when I started this talk that um, a very important legal decision, Edwards versus Aguilar, sort of changed the landscape a bit. Now let me go back to that. The Edwards decision, um, and a dissent by Justice Scalia pretty much shaped the current situation that we have in the creation and evolution controversy today. Justice Brennan wrote that it was legal to teach scientific alternatives to evolution, one of which was proposed abrupt appearance theory, which for euphemisms is just one of my very favorites all time for, for creationism. Uh, I, I think it's actually going to come back. I, I think maybe abrupt appearance theory has, has a future in the post-intelligent design world. And of course intelligent design theory was specifically um, uh, named, as it were, in order to be a scientific alternative to evolution. Of course creation science was the original scientific uh, alternative to evolution. Justice Scalia had a dissent in which he mentioned that it was perfectly reasonable for teachers to teach the evidence against evolution. And I'll come back to that in more detail. But very briefly, what do we mean by intelligent design? Well, intelligent design is a fairly broad movement with a very narrow scientific base. Um, some have compared it to a theocratic movement. Uh, their goal, quite honestly, is to replace the materialism in American society with a quote, proper Christian theism. And they do this by attacking the material basis of science, the fact that we do science by explaining nature through reference to natural causes rather than through reference to supernatural causes. That methodological naturalism is a very normal way that science has been done for over 100 years, perhaps even longer. By attacking the material base of science, they believe that they can attack the material Oriented, materialistic, uh, philosophically materialistic orientation of, of the society. Now, how do you attack science? Well, cell division is certainly a very uh, materialistic explanation. The theories involved in how cells divide is, is natural causes, but nobody's going to get excited if you stand on the corner and say, scientists are lying to you about cell division. Instead, they attack evolution because evolution within science is the most sensitive, shall we say, uh, topic. And it is one that many people have reservations about anyway. So attacking science, excuse me, attacking evolution is a way of attacking the materialist basis of science, which is a way of attacking the materialist uh, orientation of American society. That, in a nutshell, is intelligent design. They do this by claiming that there is evidence against evolution. Where have we heard that before? The scientific claims of intelligent design are pretty thin. 
One claim is something called irreducible complexity, which is promoted by um, Michael Behe in his book Darwin's Black Box. The other is the idea of the design inference from William Dembski's book of the same title and many other publications. Complex specified information or specified complexity, if you will. Both of these are pretty much the same idea. At heart, uh, these two scientific ideas, in terms of, of their definition, refer to the fact that there is terrific complexity in nature and that this complexity is unexplainable through natural causes, uh, either because of its complexity in, in Behe's terminology or because of its improbability in Dembski's probability or Dembski's uh, uh, parlance. Schematically, you can look at intelligent design as follows. Stuff like, stuff, phenomena on the planet that exhibit specified complexity or irreducible complexity could either be explained by chance or by natural causes like natural selection. Clearly, it is absurd to assume that chance could produce something like the vertebrate eye. Clearly, they say, it is absurd to assume that something like natural selection could produce irreducible complexity, since the heart of irreducible complexity is the idea that all components of a complex system have to be there at one time. Therefore, they couldn't be put together incrementally, which is what natural selection requires. Therefore, say the intelligent design proponents, intelligent design <laughs> is the explanation for this phenomenon. Now, it happens to be the case that scientists disagree that natural selection is incapable of explaining these things. I mean, the intelligent design promoters are just simply wrong when it comes to understanding natural science. Most scientists also disagree profoundly that intelligent design is a scientific idea whatsoever. We all agree chance does not produce complexity. <laughs> If you are unsure about that, please be assured that evolution is not a chance phenomenon. Natural selection, which is the major engine of, end, of evolution, is adaptive differential reproduction. There are chance elements involved in the production of the genetic variability upon which natural selection operates, but natural selection is not a chance um, process. A, a major misunderstanding about evolution. So basically, what the intelligent design people are saying is that chance and scientific processes, chance and, and evolution, can't explain something, therefore intelligent design explains it. Where have we heard this before? This is very much like the creation science two-model approach, in which disproving evolution proves, oopsie, intelligent design. Now, getting back to Scalia's dissent, I want to talk now about the current um, evidence against evolution school of anti-evolutionism, because I think this is of, of great interest and people need to know about it. Scalia wrote in his dissent that it was perfectly legal to teach the evidence against evolution. This was seized upon immediately, literally the month after the Edwards decision came down by the Institute for Creation Research. Wendell Bird wrote that school boards and teachers should be strongly encouraged to at least stress the scientific evidences and arguments against evolution in their classes. Not just the arguments against some supposed evolutionary mechanism, but against evolution per se, against the idea of common ancestry. Even if they don't wish to recognize these as evidences and arguments for creation. Evidence against evolution, proves creationism. That is the way these people think, and that if you understand that, you'll understand why they are proposing the kinds of laws and, and regulations that they propose these days. Now, in this uh, quote from the um, ICR uh, Impacts newsletter, uh, Wendell Bird is talking about school boards and teachers. Something happened in the late 80s and 90s that uh, gave a new window to anti-evolutionism, and that was the establishment in the United States of science education standards. This was actually a product of the Bush One administration. In 1989, the National Governors Association had a meeting at which uh, the first President Bush was uh, present, and uh, President Clinton um, was a governor, and the decision was made that the United States needed to have some more continuity from place to place about education. So standards in mathematics and history and science uh, were proposed. And these would be, of course, because we have local control here in the United States uh, of education, the national standards in these various disciplines would, of course, be merely advisory. 
But it did stimulate a great deal of thinking throughout the 90s. Uh, the National Science Education Standards, the kind of yellow document there, was prepared by the National Academy of Sciences uh, through a great deal of cons consultation with master teachers and scientists all over the country, a very long process of critique and consensus for about four years so that everybody was pretty much on the same page. And then the National Science Education Standards, even if they weren't uh, required to be adopted by the states, tended to be cloned by the states simply because all of the state education officials were involved in this process. It was a very smart way of doing it, much smarter than the history standards that really ran into a buzzsaw. So most of the state science standards require the teaching of evolution. Most of them use the E-word, um, but even if the word evolution is not there, the concept of common ancestry and, of course, natural selection and adaptation and so forth are in the science education standards. Now, if you're a creationist, you're seeing evolution coming into your, um, into your uh, uh, science education standards, you're going to want to do something about it. And over the years, this is just a small selection from 2000 to 2005, the National Center for Science Education uh, ran into lots of cases where either alternative theories to evolution or evidence against evolution was being proposed in science education standards around the country. Uh, in virtually every case here where you see a yes by the state, the, um, it was proposed but it was actually not passed. It wasn't passed because civic-minded citizens like yourselves, scientists and teachers and civil libertarians went to those school board meetings and testified and argued against the uh, inclusion of non-scientific ideas in the science frameworks. I want to use as an example the state of Texas. Um, Texas has had a long history of trying to discredit evolution. Back in the 70s, there was actually a disclaimer pasted into science textbooks in Texas that uh, declared evolution was a theory, not a fact, etc. Now, most science education standards have two parts. This is worth knowing because it gives you a little bit of a roadmap here. One part of the science education standards in Texas or any place else are called the process skills or the science as a way of knowing. They're sort of general statements about um, how do you, you know, what's an experiment and what's a theory and, and how do you do science. The second component of science education standards are the content standards. In physics, you teach optics and you teach the concept of mass. In um, biology, you teach, you teach cells and you teach evolution. So the two different sections of the standards are a bit different and um, uh, they refer to different things. The standards of each state are devised by a committee of teachers and scientists that's appointed for that purpose. And the Texas standards are called the Texas Educational Knowledge and Skills, T-E-K-S or TEKS. The TEKS were developed in 1998, and they have two major parts. In the process skills is a standard called 3A. The student is expected to, quote, analyze, review, and critique scientific explanations, including hypotheses and theories, as to their strengths and weaknesses using scientific evidence and information. Now, that's kind of a funny way of, of stating a critical thinking standard, but itself, it's not too weird. And it occurs, by the way, throughout all of the TEKS. Here are the, uh, here's process skill three for chemistry and biology, and you can see that basically it's the same thing. Um, I'm not sure I can read that. Um, analyze, review, and critique scientific explanations, including hypotheses and theories as to their strengths and weaknesses using scientific evidence and information. True of chemistry, of physics, of environmental science, across the board. And the other statements in the process skills are the same. Uh, sci evaluate the impact of research on scientific thought, society, and the environment. Um, describe the connection between biology and future careers, between um, chemistry and future careers. You get the idea. Generally speaking, these process skills apply across the board to all the sciences. Now, the thing about the TEKS is that they are a very strong statement from the state of Texas as to what textbooks have to include in order to be bought by the state to be um, used by the teachers. Texas buys a whole lot of textbooks. It's a really big state. It adopts from K through 12. California is a bigger state, but California only adopts K-8, so it doesn't have the clout as Texas does. Too bad. Anyway, Texas adopts 
buys a whole lot of textbooks, so pretty much what Texas wants is what you're going to get uh, in textbooks. And in 2003, there was a 2003 and 4 when high school biology texts were being considered for adoption. There was a huge fight, and the fight considered um, whether uh, the biology textbook publishers would be required to include the weaknesses of evolution in their books, whether they would have to take these books back and rewrite them to include the weaknesses of evolution. Now, if you remember earlier in my talk, we scientists don't have a list of the weaknesses of evolution, right? So what we're talking about is a lot of really bad science at best and closet creationism uh, in all probability. I really like that. <laughs> now, the good news is that uh, even though creationist members of the board fought very, very hard, cooler heads prevailed, and the textbook publishers were not made to include the weaknesses of evolution. Now, here comes 2008 and 2009, and the teaks are going to be revised. Mindful of the attack on evolution, the committees changed the wording to try to get rid of the strengths and weaknesses language. Now remember, this is a whole bunch of committees. This is physics and chemistry and biology and earth and space science, a new uh, study, uh, environmental science, marine biology. There's all these committees. Every single one of them agreed on new wording for 3A. Here's what it was. Analyze and evaluate scientific explanations using empirical evidence, logical reasoning, and experimental and observational testing. Well, yeah, that's what we do, right? Okay. That's really a critical thinking standard. Strengths and weaknesses doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. This is really what scientists do. It didn't quite last that way. Um, Dr. McElroy, who is the chairman of the Board of Education in Texas, and a young earth creationist, um, and a major, uh, he's been on the board forever. Uh, he also led the fight in 2003 to try to get the biology textbooks rewritten. Mr. McElroy and his um, colleagues tried to amend the stuffings out of 3A. Uh, they couldn't just throw out the, uh, the, word, the new wording. Well. Of course not. Every single committee was out of that. Every single committee had the exact same wording. If he had thrown out 3A across the board, he would have run into some real political problems. So he amended the bejesus out of it, basically. Supportive or not supportive? Sufficiency or insufficiency? Arguments for or against? What is not fully understood? A whole thesaurus of alternatives for strengths and weaknesses. Um, it did not help that the New Scientist published an article on horizontal gene transfer with the very splashy cover, Darwin was wrong, chopping down the tree of life. I was quite startled to be sitting there in the board meeting and hearing one of the creationist school board members say, here's this new article from the not creationist publication, New Scientist, this is mainstream science, and it is. Uh, an article talking about how evolution is a theory in crisis. Why can't we teach the students the weaknesses of evolution like this? <laughs> what do you do? Uh, don't get me started on the new scientist. Okay, so what happened? After several contentious meetings, the board finally came up with what we call son of strengths and weaknesses. Um, which is, oh, and, and by the way, excuse me, um, I propose that you can, you can predict the amount of political pressure involved in one of these statements based upon the number of prepositional phrases and conjunctions. All right? <laughs> in all fields of science, analyze, evaluate, and critique scientific explanations by using empirical evidence, logical reasoning, and experimental and observational testing. Stop there. <laughs> just, just stop. That's a good point. No. Including <laughs> examining all sides of scientific evidence of those scientific explanations so as to encourage critical thinking by the student. Count the prepositional phrases, like I say. Okay, now, we predict that a couple years from now, when high school biology textbooks come up for revision, all sides of scientific evidence will be used, much as strengths and weaknesses was uh, back in 2003, to try to pressure the textbook publishers into putting a lot of crap into the books. 
we'll see what happens. The other thing I want to tell you about, which is related, is what are referred to as academic freedom laws, which are cropping up all over the country. If you go to ncsc.com, or our old domain, ncseweb.org, we really still are a .org, but we finally got the uh, we finally got ncse.com as a domain name, yes. Anyway, cyber squatters, terrible people. Um, academic freedom legislation is cropping up all over the place. Now, I have a hypothesis that one cause of these, this kind of legislation, which I'll describe in a moment, has to do with a number of cases in the 1900s, uh, excuse me, 1990s and 2000s involving teachers. Top-down approaches, where you have uh, equal time for creation science laws, which were very popular in the late 70s, or um, district-wide laws like uh, Dover, Pennsylvania's, which require teachers to do something, haven't worked for them very well. If you can get individual teachers to bring this stuff into the classroom, you might have a better shot at it. However, there were these three cases back in the 1990s and 2000s where individual teachers did exactly freelance in quite this, this same fashion, and they were smacked down for it by the courts. Courts deciding that you can't just freelance the teaching of whatever it is you want to teach. A case that is not as well known as it should be is a Minnesota state court case, Rodney LeVake versus um, Independent School District in Faribault, Minnesota. In his complaint, Levesque holds the view that the teaching of evolution in high school should be accompanied by a critical examination of the scientific arguments and evidence both for and against the theory. Now, when this was taken to court, the Minnesota um, uh, uh, State Court ruled against him. Plaintiff asserts a free speech right to teach the criticisms of evolution in the biology classroom. Plaintiff's position is wrong. That's a useful thing to know. Here's why. The court also wrote that academic freedom is not a license for uncontrolled expression at variance with established curricular content. Plaintiff's classroom at the high school is a non-public forum, and the district has the right to limit the speech in that classroom to the teaching of the designated curriculum. In other words, if you sign the contract in a district, you have agreed to teach that district's curriculum. A K-12 teacher has virtually no academic freedom. Okay. So, what if a district is prevented from stopping a teacher from teaching alternative theories or evidence against evolution? Or what if a district tells a teacher that he can teach the evidence against evolution, not that you have to teach the evidence against evolution? I think this is part of the rationale for these academic freedom acts that we have been encountering lately. Let me tell you a little bit more about the, the nitty-gritty of these guys. The Academic Freedom Act movement started in Alabama uh, with a law in, 19, in 2004 which was intended to encourage the teaching of creationism uh, without using the term. The sponsor of this bill said, quote, this bill will level the playing field because it allows the teacher to bring forward the biblical creation story of humankind. Representative Jim Carnes was quoted as saying, quote, evolution is one theory, creation is an alternative theory. Now, the bills got out of committee, but they didn't get through the House before the legislature adjourned. But the um, legislators in Alabama are nothing if not determined, and uh, in subsequent years there have been uh, more bills uh, proposed. In this original bill and most of its successors, the claim was made that teachers need the protection of their academic freedom. Teachers need protection to teach alternative theories of origins. The purpose of this, I believe, was to prevent a district from doing as the district in Levesque and Webster and Pelosa did and tell the teacher not to teach the alternative theories. This is basically a get-out-of-jail-free card for a creationist teacher. That's really what, what we're talking about. The other thing was this bill was... was um, was permissive in the sense that it didn't require a teacher to teach alternative theories. It just said that you can teach alternative theories if you wanted. The other thing that this bill did was it would protect students if the student um, subscribes to a position on origins. But this is very scary for teachers. I mean, you can kind of imagine, as the caption says here, maybe it's not a wrong answer, maybe it's just a different answer. Uh, teachers basically don't want 
Teachers don't want laws and regulations that allow the students to say, well, I'm protected. I can write anything I want in this test, or I can write your answer, but then I can go on and on and on about creationism, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the most serious of the Academic Freedom Acts is Louisiana's, which did pass. In March 2008, a Louisiana state senator, Ben Nevers, introduced SB 561, the Louisiana Academic Freedom Act. This was modeled on a 2006 policy that had been used in Washita County, which had been promoted by the Louisiana Family Forum, which is a religious right group. The Washita Parish policy Again, was one of these strengths and weaknesses kind of uh, uh, policies, but it permitted uh, teachers to help students understand, analyze, critique, and review in an objective manner the strengths and weaknesses of existing scientific theories. What was interesting about the Washita County policy is that it added, besides evolution and origin of life, it tucked on global warming and human cloning which are usually not topics taught in high school biology. Actually, origin of life is hardly ever taught in high school biology. But these are all topics that are of great interest to the religious right. The Nevers 2008 bill was proposed, uh, and had it passed, it would have been bad indeed. It would uh, protect teachers who wanted to teach the strengths and weaknesses. It was couched in terms of critical thinking. Everybody's in favor of critical thinking, right? And it also protected uh, teachers if they wanted to bring in supplemental materials to the regular textbook, which was something that the Discovery Institute found very attractive and obviously pushed because they happened to have published a book, Explore Evolution, Explode Evolution is more like, um, which presents the weaknesses of evolution. Uh, we have a, an analysis of this on our website, and so you can find out what's wrong with it in great detail. That's what we do. Well, as it happens, uh, the original Nevers bill didn't pass, and the bill that did pass was uh, renamed the Louisiana Science Education Act. Probably they didn't want it to sound like an Alabama bill, uh, but it is still problematic. Uh, they, a lot of the really bad things of the original act were taken out, although those still are the intent of the act. The way the bill finally read, is that the teacher should foster an environment within public elementary and secondary schools that promotes critical thinking skills, logical analysis, and open and objective discussion of scientific theories. Who wouldn't, right? Including evolution, the origins of life, global warning, and human cloning. You know, the, the fact that these, uh, these scientific explanations are singled out course, sort of puts a big flashing neon light on them, of course. Uh, also, in the um, bill that was passed, the um, uh, teachers were given authority to bring in supplemental materials with very little oversight. Guess who wants that? Um, there was a procedure uh, that was vaguely referred to in the law as to how uh, a parent could bring a complaint. So like if you're in Louisiana and somebody bring your teacher starts teaching from this book, you can complain about it, but the process that you have to go through is so labyrinthian. And the deck is stacked against you because the committee that's appointed includes the publisher and includes, yeah, it's not a very good system. No. This is for the true creation and evolution geeks in this audience. This is the, this is the phylogeny of academic <laughs> freedom acts. This, this was drawn up by my colleague Anton Mates, a wonderful young man who's just gone off to graduate school in Washington, and I'm sure he'll be a fine scientist. But he actually did this, did this marvelous, marvelous uh, phylogeny, reading all of the bills and, and making a timeline and figuring out what was influenced by what. So I just have to go over this with you because it's so much fun. Geek out, you guys. <laughs> the left-hand side of this um, uh, phylogeny originated with the original Alabama bill. And this deals with the rights of students and teachers. It involves the legal protection of teachers and the idea of alternative theories. Now, the Alabama bill was critiqued by this, the Discovery Institute, which of course is the intelligent design think tank up in, Washington, uh, uh, in Seattle, Washington. And later versions of the bill dropped reference to alternative theories and replaced it with the full range of scientific views. 
Now, that is a phrase from the Santorum Amendment to the No Child Left Behind Act. And you can think, you can sort of hear why this is better linguistics. Alternative views might make somebody think of creationism. There's nobody here but us, but us uh, scientists and teachers, right? We certainly don't want creationism to be taught, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Full range of scientific views doesn't sound as much like we're proposing creationism, but of course, the full range of scientific views includes the alternative theories, right? So this is, this is a way of trying to duck some of the legal challenges that will doubtless be applied to these, um, to these uh, laws at, at some point. Um, the tree on the right represents another strain of academic freedom acts, this time arising from the Washita Parish um, critical analysis, strengths and weaknesses. It also is a permissive policy but it tacks on these other religious right uh, enthusiasms like global warming, origin of life, cloning, and so forth. Um, a little bit later on, the provision was added that administrators cannot censor materials, which of course was something encouraged by the uh, intelligent design promoters because they had this nice handy dandy book that they could sell a lot of copies for. Uh, and they also put in the obligatory, oh, but this is not to promote religion. And bundling evolution with other religious right enthusiasms, uh, such as global warming, is part of the parcel. Now, we have here a little horizontal gene transfer uh, between these two. <laughs> As you can perhaps uh, imagine, these, these don't occur in a, in a vacuum. And we are likely to see uh, more evolution of this type in the future. Stay tuned, because there will be a new legislative season beginning in January. And we'll, we'll be adding to this tree, I'm sure. The summary of the Evidence Against Evolution or Academic Freedom Act approach includes the fact that they assiduously try, sorry, assiduously try to avoid any overt mention of religion whatsoever. You noticed in the bills that I was quoting to you, there was no effort whatsoever to um, mention God, mention creationism. They, they are getting better and better at whitewashing the uh, overt religiosity out of their position. The stress is on academic freedom, on free speech, rather than on free exercise, the other First Amendment um, a clause. Uh, and everybody's in favor of academic freedom, right? Who isn't? Raise your hand if you're against academic freedom. You know, it's not going to happen. Um, they also are protective bills, which is very clever. Um, they, they will protect a teacher who wants to teach alternatives or evidence against evolution, something like that. Again, the get out of jail free card. And perhaps the most interesting thing about these bills is that they are permissive rather than directive. Rather than like the Dover policy where uh, the teachers were told in Dover, Pennsylvania, you will teach A, B, and C, this says you can teach A, B, and C. The reason why that's clever has to do with the legal system. We could go to the judge in Dover and say, we want an injunction because this policy requiring the teaching of this bad stuff is going to cause harm. And you know, the, you have a chance of getting one. If you go to a judge with one of these permissive policies, it's harder to get an injunction. It's harder to challenge the bill on its face. Okay? A facial challenge is much more difficult. The judge is much more likely to say something like, well, you know, nobody's really done it yet. You know, let's just see what happens. Let's see how it plays out. What the lawyers call an as-applied challenge. That's a lot harder. If you can make a facial challenge like we did in, in Dover, you can find your plaintiffs. The plaintiffs have, have a much easier time of, of uh, establishing the standing to sue. With an as-applied challenge, you've actually got to go out there and find the teacher who's stepping over the line. You've got to find that teacher and then find somebody in that classroom or who would be taking the class the next year who has standing, who is willing. Uh, it, it's, it, the barriers I just raised much, much higher. It's a very clever uh, way of trying to duck uh, some of the legal problems that they have had in the past. Finally, they avoid singling out evolution by embedding evolution with other topics like global warming and so forth. Because in an earlier case, Epperson versus Arkansas, the Supreme Court said, hey, you know, when you single out evolution like that, 
you are ipso facto, prima facie, and whatever other Latin phrases you want to whip out. You are just saying, we're being religious, because it's, you know, why just single out evolution from all other things? Well, evolution is the one sub subject in the curriculum that causes problems for people's religion. So they embed evolution with global warming and some of these other enthusiasms as a way of trying to work around Epperson. So the, the legal strategy is getting much, much clever. Um, most of you who have read any of NCSE stuff know that we obsess about something called the pillars of creationism. And, and the reason I keep bringing this up is because it's a really easy thing to remember. If you can remember these three arguments, virtually every claim that a creationist makes or letter to the editor or any other kind of communication, book, whatever, it could be fit into one of the three of these. And if you can recognize these, you can place any of the argument into it, and then you automatically know the answer to the argument once you understand the, argument, the responses to the pillars. The first pillar, of course, is that evolution is a theory in crisis. Scientists are giving up on evolution. It is no longer considered uh, um, a valid, um, hello, all of a sudden, here we go. It is no longer considered a valid argument. The second pillar of creationism is that evolution and religion are incompatible. That's something that is uh, exercised with great enthusiasm. And the fairness argument, that it's only fair if you teach uh, evolution that you balance it with something. We'll either balance it with creationism or balance it with creation science, balance it with intelligent design, balance it with uh, uh, evidence against evolution. You're seeing a pattern here, right? What we're seeing today is the first and third. The Academic Freedom Acts um, are claims about the validity of evolution, but also very, very strong claims to promote the fairness uh, 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 pillar. Uh, if you look at the um, proposed Academic Freedom Act, which you can find on the web, uh, the, um, the way of marketing this is extremely clever. Let me teach. Let me think. Who doesn't want your kids to think, right? The framing of this argument is very, very clever. It's framed in terms of critical thinking and academic freedom, not framed in terms of promoting somebody's religious idea. The um, Discovery Institute has the Academic Freedom Petition, which you can quickly go down to their website and um, sign up for. And there again, we're talking about the academic freedom of teachers to teach the strengths and weaknesses. Uh, teachers will be protected from being fired, harassed, intimidated, etc. Also part of the frame that the intelligent design people are very enthusiastically promoting that um, they are the underdogs and being discriminated against by big science. I guess that's us. Is big science. And teachers are, and students also will be protected in these bills. So that's where we are. And uh, as I say, come January, there's going to be more of this. Uh, we fully expect to have uh, new and improved versions of Academic Freedom Acts stressing these kinds of critical thinking and academic freedom, not religiously sounding ideas whatsoever. If you want to know more about this, you can go to ncse.com. If you go to um, this little button over here, you can sign up for a, a Friday electronic newsletter that will depress you uh, and give you the <laughs> what, what, give you the news for, for what goes on during the week. If you go to the news uh, button up here, you'll be taken to this page where you can sort for whatever state you're interested in or you can sort for a year of interest and you'll pull up all of the uh, news that we have about what's going on in that state in terms of the creation and evolution controversy. Um, and of course, it's a membership organization, so you're welcome to join. I will not discourage you from doing so. Um, my colleagues are Glenn Branch, who uh, writes that wonderful Friday e-newsletter that many of you get, and, and uh, I know from the feedback we get, uh, that is just an extraordinarily helpful thing for many people. Louise Mead is our Education Outreach Director. Robert Lunn is our Communications Director. Peter Hess is our Faith Outreach Director. And our three wonderful flare-up <laughs> wranglers, the guys who uh, spend most of their time giving advice to teachers and school board members and lawyers and everybody else, Josh Rosenau, Steve Newton, and Eric Mickle. Um, it's a really great bunch of people to work with, and I'm extremely pleased that uh, I have such a you know, talented staff. And of course, like all right-minded organizations, we are naturally on Facebook. And um,
There we go. Oops. Well, I must say, it's a very good feeling to have Jeannie Scott and her gang on one side in this battle. Um, in, in a few minutes, I have to go and catch a plane, but I, I'd like to initiate the uh, question session if people want to uh, ask questions to Jeannie. I, well, I know it's not, but it's not my fault. Um, so I am one of those people that lives in Texas. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering, as a citizen that doesn't have uh, kids, um, but is interested in trying to make sure that everyone else you know, does get the right education, what is just an ordinary citizen going to do, obviously, other than just voting the right people? Never, never underestimate the importance of voting the right people. Right. I mean, you may not have kids, but you have one vote. And you know something? Don McLeary has one vote. <laughs> it's always good to remind people of that, you know? The creationists each have one vote just like scientists. Um, there are various ways. Certainly join the Texas Citizens for Science. Uh, there's another wonderful organization that we partnered with uh, in addition to TCS, and that's the... Um, come on, thank you. Texas Freedom Network. Wonderful people. They really do great work. Also, if you'd like to become really hands-on, I don't know what your background is, uh, if you're a scientist, if you're, you know, whatever. Um, if you can volunteer at your local school, they always need extra people. They need people for tutoring. They need extra people to check out books in the library. I mean, there's, get to know your local teachers. Teachers are fabulous people. I think we'll take, we'll have to kind of shorten the question period because um, there is a book signing, but then there's also the, um, uh, we we have the, the closing ceremonies are like 12:15 or something. 12:30. Oh, <laughs> we can do more questions. Yes, sir. Hi. Tons of time. Thank you very much for um, coming and speaking to all of us. Um, I was just recently talking to my sister who was here with me. She's a biology major at a university, the University of Northern Iowa, and we were talking about before we started speaking how depressing it is that she will be in the same degree as people who, as biology majors, still don't fully accept evolution. And how, at the very least, they should probably have an asterisk at the end of their, <laughs> at the end of their degree that says they're history deniers, as Professor Dawkins calls them in his new book. And um, my question is, do you think that high school and college faculty just aren't, are, are too nice and aren't forceful enough to let these people know that evolution is, for all intents and purposes, a fact. Well, I don't know how you can force someone to accept a scientific idea. I mean, you know, be more forceful in, in what sense? You don't whack somebody over the head because they don't accept, you know, this enzyme being involved in cell division. But, I take your point and I, I really want to underscore it. Um, my biggest gripe, frankly, is with my fellow college professors. I'm a recovering college professor myself. Um, I don't think college professors are doing a very good job teaching evolution. If high school teachers come out of four years of college, and some of them are biology majors, right? They don't understand evolution. That's not the fault of the education department. That's the fault of the arts and science biology department and geology department and astronomy department. We can do a whole lot better job of teaching evolution to undergraduates. After all, people who graduate from college go on to become school board members, go on to become teachers, go on to become captains of industry and, and voters. And we need to have, we need to do a much better job teaching the nature of science and teaching what evolution really is. You know, I was, I travel a lot and speak a lot at campuses around the country. And um, usually I'm invited by the science departments. I do a talk for them and I'll do a public lecture as well. And one of the things I always ask the uh, biology department people is, do you require a course in evolution for your biology majors? 
And oftentimes there's a certain amount of squirming going on because they haven't quite gotten around to doing that yet. And I said, well, when are you going to catch up to Brigham Young? <laughs> of course, what needs to be done at the university level in the biology departments is to bring evolution into every single class. Not save it for the course in evolution, but bring it into every single course, every single class, at least once a week. Figure out how, those of you who are scientists, figure out how you can bring the idea of common ancestry into biochemistry, molecular biology, organismic biology, uh, population biology, it's easy there, um, to <laughs> In ecology as well. Next question. You mentioned that the article in the New Scientist on that of gene transfer didn't help. Are you saying that New Scientists were publishing all science or just that it was misconstrued? The, the question had to do with the New Science uh, cover. The article itself wasn't that bad. Although, you know, sometimes scientists don't think very think about how they phrase things, and you can phrase things in ways that don't mislead the public. There were some phrasings that I would certainly have appreciated a little more thoughtfulness there. But basically the article wasn't bad. The article was talking about how at the single-celled organism level, uh, the level of, of archaea and protist and stuff like that, you have a lot of swapping around of genetic information. Now, more than one person in that article pointed out that once you get to multiple-celled organisms, once you get to metazoa, oh yeah, you get trees. It's just the little stuff, you know, it's just the single-cell stuff, which it's really complicated. That doesn't, that's not an argument against evolution. But the goofballs at New Scientist had this big splashy cover, Darwin was wrong. Well, give me a break, Darwin didn't know anything about, you know, horizontal gene transfer. How could Darwin be wrong? The idea being is that, that there's no tree of life anymore. Well, that's just nonsense. If the bottom of the tree is a banyan, that doesn't mean that there's not a tree, right? Um, once you get metazoa, you get trees. Not a big deal. So my beef with uh, New Scientist is that if they want to have a flashy cover that will get people to buy the magazine, I don't have a problem with that. But don't do something that is going to deliberately mislead the public about what evolution is. You know, National Geographic had a really great cover a couple years ago. Was Darwin wrong? I imagine a lot of people picked that cover, you know, picked up that issue of National Geographic to see if Darwin was wrong. And you open it up and says, no. <laughs> And what I might uh, add was about 94 uh, point type. <laughs> so you kind of couldn't miss it. Yes, sir. Um, uh, everyone's familiar with the claim that there's no transitional forms and we have so few fossils and everything. And um, you have all of these wonderful skulls up there, either the best specimens or the type specimens of the species they represent. And I'm wondering, could the fact that we show the same pictures of the same you know, a dozen skulls over and over and over again instead of emphasizing the hundreds and thousands of fossils which all match, you know, different parts of, of, the, of the overall skeleton. Could that be causing uh, part of the problem with people not accepting that there are actually thousands of fossils? I, I mean... I don't think we're overusing any particular example. Um, the big idea that you and I would both support is that we need to inform the public that there are wonderful transitional series. Uh, Don Prothero's book, if you haven't taken a look at it out there, and even bought it, it's a good book. Um, Don's book has got marvelous stuff about whales, about horses. You know, there's lots of sequences that, that show really, really good um, gradual change through time, and even more so when you get into invertebrates. So um, I, I don't think that people are saturated with, um, with uh, the same old examples. I think they just don't know in general what the examples are. One slide that I use that's very effective, I think, in, in, in public audiences is a slide that was prepared by uh, an NCSC member whose name now escapes me, and I will really be embarrassed since this is going to be on the Internet and I'm not giving him credit for it. But it's a slide showing from the earliest Australopithecines, well, this is pre-Artipithecus, but, you know, the earliest Austro Australopithecines up until modern humans. And, you know, I show this and say, okay, draw a line. 
where is the ape, where is the human? And of course it's impossible. Because even, even if you only look at skulls, you can't, you know, we, we have such a variety now that we can't even, we can't, um, we can't say that there is hard and fast lines between them. Thank you for your question. We'll have one more question, please. Thank you. Um, are there protections in these academic, academic freedom acts for the teacher who refuses to bring in all of it? Well, because they're permissive, you don't have to bring it in. But what if a parent or a student in the classroom wants uh, the alternate theories brought in? Can the teacher be protected from being forced to bring in? It depends on the wording of the law. Um, in, in several uh, manifestations, it wouldn't matter because the teacher can make the decision. The law is written in terms of the teacher's right to do A, B, or C. But the point being, even if the law uh, it reads one way literally, it is still the case that teachers find laws like this highly intimidating. And I think the net effect of these kinds of laws is just the teachers don't get around to teaching evolution this year. <coughs> just couldn't get to it. It's kind of in the back of the book anyway, and we had to spend so much time memorizing the enzymes in photosynthesis. So um, we, we have much more problem in the United States with teachers skipping evolution than we do with the actual frank teaching of creationism. And, but that former is a major problem if your concern is with um, public understanding of science and science literacy. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of your conference.